the policies right now incentivize the cartels and human smugglers because the cartel there is actually the Mexican police. They'll come in multiple vehicle, they'll drop off multiple migrants. Doesn't matter where you're from or what the rules are, everyone should be let in. I've talked to Border Patrol agents off air. They feel like human smugglers. This is an area that's extremely dangerous. Border Patrol agents actually have been shot from this side. Do you guys feel like you've been left out, like no one's paying attention to you? Arizona leads the country in the gotaways, and those are... Why are the Catholic charities involved in this? Do you know that story? When the feds were secretly flying out migrants, he got a bunch of pictures leaked. If you're an individual coming from that country, you have basically no chance of staying. It's like a silent crisis that you're not really supposed to talk about. You're not supposed to talk about, says who? What's interesting, they have security with construction workers. Yeah, yeah, I've never, like, I've never seen this before here. All right, guys, here with Jorge, and we're going to do our best to unpack the, uh, the nuances, let's call them or the confusion in the situation down here. And you know both sides really well. Yeah, the immigration Mexican story- and, and U.S. side. Is, uh, it's very complicated. And it's, you know, sometimes when you watch the news, you can't cover this issue in like a two minute, three minute, you know, TV hit. And lots of Americans who maybe don't live uh, near the border um, might not know the true situation, um, the human suffering aspect side. Yeah. And also how kind of the local communities are, are dealing with this issue as well. And it's become completely polarized. I guess it always has been. Yes. The goal mm -hmm. of today's video is just to drop as many concrete facts as we can for everyone of all sides to just understand what's going on here. Okay, we're gonna try to get down here. Uh, I like it. You can slide you... the Crocs. Ah. There's this guy here. I was with the sheriff here, Yuma County Sheriff. We went all over, it was unbelievable, uh, crazy day. One thing that came into the conversation, she's saying no. <laughs> okay, one thing that came into conversation, the gotaways and the give ups. So some are trying to come over and get caught by US Customs Border Protection. Others want to sneak in and not get caught. One people that don't know is a gotaway is our individuals that enter the country illegally, border patrol agents are able to detect with technology, yeah. but are not, they don't have the manpower to apprehend those individuals. Okay. Oh, okay. We'll just cruise by here, is that what you want us to do? Sorry for all the restrictions at the time. Don't worry, thank you for what you're doing. Okay, gotaways tried to sneak in here Exactly. The give ups want to get caught because they're going to be brought into the country. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is the give ups, what we're seeing is like just regular migrants that are literally just escaping. So, like Nicaragua, Venezuela, um, that want the better life, right? So, it's I the I saw families. Indians yesterday. I I Indians, right? So, you'll, what you'll see is they'll enter the country legally, they'll wait for Border Patrol, and they want to be apprehended and, and processed. Okay. The reason why you have individuals that don't want that uh, part is yes. because they've most likely have already committed a criminal crime inside the United States or have uh, okay. been previously deported and it's on their record. So a gotaway okay. doesn't want to see a border patrol agent. Um, a lot of gotaways are, are right, now, right now majority men and they'll be actually wearing uh, like the camouflage clothing. They'll have like these shoes that would hide footprints. So they're actively looking to evade law enforcement. And it's a worry because we don't have any information on these, on these individuals of, okay. of who they are. This is famously known as uh, the Yuma Gap. Here on this side in Los Algodones, this is one of the main highways. Okay, here, right up here. Used by cartels and smugglers. They'll come in multiple vehicle, they'll drop off uh, multiple migrants. The past year has become extremely dangerous. Border Patrol agents don't even go down there because smugglers are armed and have knives and they collect the payment in the daytime from the migrants. Um, one of my actually last experiences down there you know, I was down there reporting, um, kind of documenting the, the, the smuggler tactics. One smuggler actually saw that I was filming him at the Colorado River, and he actually took his gun out, pointed it at me, oh, and then demanded to like, basically for me to give him, give him my phone in Spanish. Now, I think what just happened to me was my, my mind went to fight or flight, and I just went to flight, and I ran back here, and where I counted other reporters, and then we actually ended up um, going back to the video, getting a screenshot of that individual, posting it on Twitter, in the very next day, Border Patrol agents here actually sent in what they call Border TAC, which is the tactical unit of Border Patrol that's actually armed and everything. And they essentially shut down that human smuggling route for like 
three or four days looking for those armed human smugglers. So this is an area that's extremely dangerous. Um, Border Patrol agents actually have been shot from this side okay. uh, multiple times, and it's why I believe we see security with a, a, a construction crew okay. down there. How much to get just across the river right now? What's the cost? So right here, just, just this part could be like 100 200 bucks, but the whole process oh, okay. could be up to $6,000 for them to just get to this moment here. Okay, so it really depends on where someone's coming from. Mm -hmm. If if someone shows up at the border, they're gonna pay 100, 200 bucks yep. just to get across this. Okay, I and thought the, it was way more. And it depends where you're at too. In Texas, it's different. Every border crossing is different. But many of these maggots have already paid thousands of dollars just to get to the crossing point. This is called the Colorado River, and the U.S.-Mexico border is right in the middle of it. So if you're a migrant, once you pass that, you technically have to be taken in by Border Patrol agents. So even if this wall was, let's say it's, all the gaps were, were filled and there was, there was migrants, let's say, waiting behind the wall, they're technically on American soil, so Border Patrol agents would have to take them in. Okay. And that's something that I think a lot of people don't, don't know. And these guys out here are all day laborers, right? They yep. go back and forth. They go back and forth. But they have, they have permits or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, they go Visas. back and forth uh, from Los Agaldones. A bus will take them early in the morning, take them here, they work all day, and as soon as the shift's done, we'll take them back to Mexico. What nationalities can come here and be taken into the United States right now? Because there are certain ones that they're gonna be sent back immediately, like other than Mexican, right? I hear that, like Mexicans can't come over. They're Mexicans, gonna be deported immediately. Immediately. Um, majority of Hondurians and Guatemalans are getting sent back immediately, unless they come in with like kids and then kind of make that argument that they're, they're a family. But if you're an individual coming for the, from, those, from that country, you have basically no chance of staying. Okay, so how does that work? Like, who decides what countries? That's just a federal government. It's the federal government also making agreements with like those countries. So um, last year, the federal government had a lot of issue deporting Venezuelans because Venezuela would not accept those bodies. And then the, oh. then, then the federal government said, they communicated to Mexico, hey Mexico, would you take these Venezuelan nationals? And Mexico said no. Now this year started, uh, the Biden administration did ex extend Title 42, so it, it, it's a Trump era policy that they extended. For those that don't know, that was for COVID to mm -hmm. not let foreign nationals in. And that, right? that, that, yeah, that gave the federal government the ability to immediately expel migrants okay. without having an immigration hearing. Now, with the, with the new administration, when they came in, they said, hey, we wanna overturn Title 42. Right now it's in the, in the Supreme Court. So we probably won't get that decision till June. But what the, what the administration did also do is, and they're getting they're getting hit from their kind of their own base on this. Is they ended up actually extending Title Forty Two okay. to Cubans, Nicaraguans, and Haitians, and they just got Mexico to agree to take Venezuelan nationals. I met some Colombians yesterday, mm -hmm. Ecuadorians. They're okay with Title Forty Two. They, they will not be in. deported with, under under Title Forty Two because Mexico will not accept those nationalities. Oh, that explains a lot. Yeah, Mexico's no, cooperation that, is such a big deal on this. So when like Trump was in office, yeah. he pressured Mexico, and then that's when you had the controversial policy called uh, Migration Protection Protocol, which is the Remain in Mexico policy. Yeah. So if you cross illegally, even though you do want to make an asylum claim, the federal government will then place you in a Mexican border town, and you would have to wait in that Mexican border town for your asylum case. Okay. That's why under the previous administration, we saw the, the deterrence, right? Because if you're a migrant, the thinking was, well, why would I spend money, you know, with my smugglers and cartels and putting my hands, you know, putting my life in danger, only to be told to wait in a Mexican town, which sometimes that Mexican town could be more dangerous than the home country they're fleeing because cartel control or right. Mexican police control. There, which... There's no incentive to really come up. Right. What's going on right now and what I find missing from most media most of these migrants coming here are claiming asylum. Mm -hmm. They're fleeing from terrible conditions. Now, when you break down into, let's just call it a pie graph, right? What percentage of that pie graph are legitimate asylum cases, meaning they go to the courts and the courts determine this is a legitimate asylum case, we're letting the person in, versus they're just claiming asylum to get in right now. Because from my understanding, the courts are backed up Two years or more? A conservative number yeah. would be 15% are legit asylum uh, claims. I would even go as low as, as 10 and maybe even lower. Okay, where do you get the number from? So I'm speaking to sources in DHS who are, who are what, they're, what they're telling me is 90% of the people coming okay. are what they're calling economic migrants, coming for the economic okay. reason. Yep. And that is just not gonna make a strong enough case 
in court when they're going to look for proof of either, you know, fearing political persecution, some type of political violence from, the, from their home country. So the best thing I found online, best scholar, scholarly source, it was from 2020, I believe. I'll drop it in here. They were saying, I believe, 72% are illegitimate. Migrants who could maybe make that case right now the best right. would be the Russians that we're running into. And Russians actually uh, come through this. This is one of the kind of the more unique human uh, smuggling operations here in Yuma. Now in this place, just this, this spot alone, I've encountered migrants from over 50 different countries. So we're talking from obviously Central America up to South America, so Peru, Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, of course, um, Cubans in the Caribbean, Haitians, uh -huh. and all the way from people from Uzbekistan, Georgia. I ran into uh, folks from Afghanistan, and I've also met Chinese nationals. Um, but right now, lately, uh, I've been seeing an increased uh, number of them of the amount of Russians who are coming here, seeing that they are fl fleeing uh, Putin's regime. So they might have the strongest case for a legit asylum claim. Okay, how much do you think they're paying to get over here? Or it's actually pretty easy for them, I think, because they can fly to Mexico without a visa, from my understanding. Yes. They're flying to Mexicali, which is what, 20 miles that way? Mm -hmm. They're getting a transportation to ride over here, and then they're just coming up. So not, they're not doing the long, hard slog through like Central America, through Mexico, coming up mm -hmm. here. They're actually flying. The nickname that they're calling it here is they're calling it um, the long distant, the long distant migrant. And that's because they found out a system where if you fly into the Mexicali airport from there, and the locals actually from the migrants that I spoke with kind of know how the operations work. They then convinced the migrants that they could take them to a crossing point and they facilitate them here. What's particularly interesting is I was speaking with the Cubans, right? Because a lot of my audience is asking me, well, how are Cubans from this little island getting to Mexico then crossing into Yuma? So when I was speaking with Cubans, right. what they told me was they can't fly directly to Mexico because Mexico requires a visa from the Cubans. So what Cubans do is they fly directly to Nicaragua. Cubans do not need a visa to fly into Nicaragua. Um, they'll fly from Nicaragua from, from there. They'll, they'll, they'll then begin their journey. What the Cuban nationals have also told me is that because the Cuban officials in Cuba know this kind of operation, they actually charge these people about $4,000 to $6,000 just for the plane ticket to Nicaragua. So, so so wow. even Cuban officials know that the Cubans uh, going to Nicaragua uh, will not be coming back to Cuba. Okay, so when the Cuban spends the four thousand, three, four thousand dollars in a plane ticket, they get to Nicaragua, they have to pay the cartels to get them up here. Yep. What's that cost right now? That could also range between two thousand to six thousand dollars, and two lots six, of these okay. lots of these migrants, especially the ones coming from Central America and South America. Yeah. Uh, the cartels are now experts in getting those people, contacting actually the family relatives in the United States, and then getting the people in America, like their family members, to send the money to the coyotes or smugglers and bring them up uh, that process. So I've interviewed um, Central American families here in the U.S., South American families here in the U.S. that have done that process where they send in five grand to a with you know the, the term is coyote um a smoke that they have no idea and they're essentially putting their trust that this smoke is going to bring their family to the u.s border well folks maybe that don't know is arizona leads uh the country in the gotaways and those are the criminals coming in folks in camouflage also running drugs in one of the the kind of complex tactics that we see is um around here every night Two in the morning, um, we come here, we actually, we will go behind this wall and there's a human smuggling around. And what we'll do is you'll see about 30 car drop off in the middle of the night, dropping people off in these highways, and arm human smugglers will then guide these people through the brushes and then direct them to basically run around this border wall and essentially wait for border patrol right here. So this is one of the, 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 the routes that the cartel controls. It's a tactic that they've used and what they'll do on the American side then, like for border patrol agents like this man here and the local sheriffs, it, it overwhelms the local resources, right? Because they all yep. have to pay attention sure. to these migrants. And then when that happens, those gaps open up for gotaways and then for drugs to be run into the country. And so what about human trafficking, sex trafficking, that sort of thing? Is that common? Is it very rare? It's very common. Or hard to know. It's no, it's it's very common. Now, what might actually surprise people, and that, that surprised me is speaking to women migrants who shared their stories with me, they've actually been sexually assaulted and raped more by Mexican police than actu actual narco traffickers. I've actually had migrants tell women migrants tell me that they're more afraid of the Mexican police than the actual narco traffickers Jeez. that that control the borders. We were uh, reporting here last year. There was a 10 year old boy that was laying here on the dirt, um, okay. completely passed out. And, you know, we, we didn't know what, what was going on. So these two women uh, pick up this, this boy and they take him to uh, Border Patrol. And as they're walking up, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get an interview and say, hey, what, what's going on with this boy? And 
what the two migrant women mentioned to me, and this is a story of many, is that this boy was abandoned in Mexicali by, by smugglers. He was actually left naked, is what they told me. And they basically dressed up this boy, hiked him up from Mexicali in, into Yuma as they were, they were crossing as well. And then when they went to go turn the boy in, we actually lifted up his uh, sleeves and uh -huh. he had uh, his grandfather's phone number back in Guatemala written on his arm. It's actually quite common to see unaccompanied minors come to the border and then them having written phone numbers of the relatives back home. So lots of these kids uh, get sent to the border by themselves, uh, unaccompanied from, right now the majority are coming from Central America, the unaccompanied minors. The kids are being sent by themselves just to get into the United States. Mm -hmm. But I've also heard kids are like being rented. Is that correct? Like yeah. come with people. Cause if you come in with kids, your chances are way better. Is that, is that, that correct? And, and that, that is correct. Okay. And so far, um, there's been over 250,000 unaccompanied minors that have reached the border. According to Axios, they're actually saying that one out of three unaccompanied children that are released inside the United States, the government is now losing track of. And the reason why the government is losing track of is because the system is so overwhelmed when it comes to the vetting of the sponsors, they don't have enough time to do a complete vetting process. So when they do release uh, that child, when they end up doing the follow-up, uh, they're losing that, that child inside the United States now. So what happened there? Are those people walking through? Yeah, so as soon as they came over, a uh, Border Patrol agent apprehended. Um, they looked like they wanted to give, give themselves up and it's a pretty you know smooth process. They're not gonna try to run away. And Border Patrol right now could handle that, right? A couple people put them in the truck, uh, but later at night is when they'll be completely overwhelmed and, and they'll need that, the big school buses to, to bring these groups in. So what about the argument, like, let's just say the majority are are fleeing terrible situations. Why not let just everybody in, just an endless amount of people in? We're a wealthy country. We're, you know, we're, we're open to the world. We're a country of immigrants, right? Mm -hmm. The argument then from the other side would, it's gonna be, if we just let everyone in, it will then actually hurt uh, American workers on this side. And there's actually this kind of famous interview uh, back in 2015, uh, Bernie Sanders, he's actually being interviewed by this progressive journalist. And the progressive journalist asked him, hey, how come we just don't let in, let in the global poor, right? Like the poorest people, let them come here, let, let them work. Yeah. And then Bernie kind of scoffs at the question and goes, that's a Koch brothers conspiracy. And the guy goes, what do you mean? He goes, well, if we just had a complete open border system, um, corporations in the US would then undermine American wages and there would be no incentive to raise American wages. Yeah, sure. So that's why you actually have establishment Republicans and then establishment Democrats kind of agreeing on if, if, the, if, if the term is called open border because they want an influx to basically have workers for those corporations and then undermine right. the American workers. So that's, that's an argument from there. Um, obviously it's a national security issue. So you, you, know, you just have to vet everyone that, that, that sure. comes to con in, into the country. Uh, a lot of the folks who are gotaways have committed sex crimes here. Yep. Um, and I've, I've talked to reporters that, that, that reported that. Uh, so it's a, it's a complex issue. I think right now the, the big thing is, is that we have a massive backlog. The last number that, that we got from DHS right now, they're backed up 1.6 million uh, asylum uh, cases that are pending right now. So even if I told you 100,000, that's a massive backlog. They're at 1.6 million. That's why it's, it's quite common um, if you speak to a migrant and they are giving them an asylum hearing, it could be three years or more okay. till that uh, case is gonna be heard in court. And so this is what I've learned in my few journeys to the border. The majority of, of them are not legitimate asylum cases. They're economic migrants, like you're stating. So they know they're not gonna win in court, therefore they don't show up, therefore they stay in the US sort of in this quasi-illegal status, and then perhaps in eight years they get pulled over for a speeding ticket, deported, they raise their kids here, one big mess. Right? Well, th this could also happen too, which is the, the majority of the cases when they get um, when they get pulled over, um, they're, they're actually technically still allowed to be in the U.S. Now, when they miss their, their court hearing, that's when ICE gets notified. And what we're seeing now, uh, a quite uh, it's a trend really among ma major cities, is that local law enforcement will not work with the federal government. So if you're, let's say like you're, let's say you're in LA County, where I'm from, and you get pulled over as an as an as an illegal that, that missed a court case for a speeding ticket. Um, that cop will probably just literally give him a citation, but that not inform ICE, not inform federal government, and that's going to be up to ICE to then go find that individual. Okay. The issue is you have literally millions of those individuals all over the country. Right. So you're not any anti-immigrant 
per se. So what's the what's the right way to do this then? What are, what are your thoughts? You've seen, you've been on here a lot, and you've been on. The, I want to get into this. You've been on the Mexican side a lot, and you speak fluent Spanish, so you have a different perspective too. Like, what what's your best scenario to deal with this situation? Because it's not easy. Yeah, it's uh, the 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 big thing is um, if we could somehow clear this massive backlog of asylum cases and have it where. Migrants could enter the country legally and safe, and if they want to have their asylum case heard, that we could have like a speedy trial where they have that case heard within 30 days. Because the issue with the Remain in Mexico uh, policy, even though it's, it's popular with uh, Republicans, is that it does put migrants in danger, right? Because you're, right. you're placing them in this Mexican border town, which they're not un unfamiliar. It's yeah. controlled by narco traffickers, and their case could, could go, you know, they might not even hear a, a case for a whole year. Right. And so that puts those folks in danger. Um, the, at the end of the day, no one is blaming for migrants coming to the United States. We all get it. I, I would honestly, like if I was born in El Salvador today, I would be on this yeah. journey too. Yeah, yeah. Um, the thing is, the policies right now incentivize the cartels and human smugglers because essentially the smugglers have the selling point to the migrants saying, hey, we'll bring you to the U.S. and as soon as you cross over, you'll get released and then you're in the United States. And to the credit of the cartels, they're completely correct. So, you know, if they bring them up and these folks touch U.S. US soil, the majority of them are going to get released. So there's no incentivize, there's no de there's no deterrence. And right now the people who are baking in are smugglers, uh, cartels, and they're, I mean, they're, the sex crimes and everything that I've been interviewing with, with, with women is, uns is unspeakable. So right now the, the, the whole system is broken, is, is broken, and I think the backlog is, is, the, is the main thing. Okay. And if we had that clear backlog, it would, I think, incentivize migrants to just continue to enter through the port of entry. Now, if you're a migrant, I don't blame them for not going through a port of entry because the asylum case is, is taking so long to be heard. You almost, you know, there's, when your life is on the line and you want to feed your kids, you're going to do anything. Yeah. Um, so these folks are going to be like, well, we're not going to wait. We're going to, we'd we'll rather cross now. And for some of these folks, even if they're uh, deported under Title 42, uh, one of the positives for them under Title 42 is that it doesn't go on your record. So if you are deported under Title 42, okay. you could essentially try again without having to strike on your on your record. So this is Yuma Regional Center. Okay. And this is here. where uh, injured migrants uh, are taken to be treated. Sometimes smugglers will just drop off migrants who are injured. They'll just kind of be yep. laying on the ground on, on the street. Um, a lot of folks suffer the obviously dehydration out here in the, in the Arizona deserts and things like that. The CEO of this hospital is now saying that they have over $20 million in unpaid services and the federal government as of right now has not reimbursed them for those services. So okay. this is where we kind of see the impact on local resources and the manpower here. And, and this hospital is being hit hard by that right now. Is that the federal government's responsibility or whose responsibility is it? Uh, legally? Anything with uh, with migrants is legally federal government. So one question oh, okay. that I get asked okay. a lot, Peter, is yeah. maybe you get asked this covering, covering the border is, well, why can't local law enforcement just deport them? Or that's, you know, that, that's what I always get. Why can't, we, why can't like a cop just pick them up and send them back? It's because since they are a federal government problem, it all has to be done by by the feds. I'm liking Yuma. Oh, me too. It's beautiful, huh? It's beautiful. I mean, the people are nice. Super friendly here. Super friendly. Morning walks every morning. They got great food. People are like, hey, yeah. how are you doing? Out of the park. A lot of border towns are like that, right? They're very tight knit, family orientated. Majority of folks are working class. Yeah. Maybe that's it. It has like this 90s feel of like tight community. And maybe I got it wrong, but that's what at least where I'm staying. I walk down, everyone says hi. Yeah, and I can tell the difference, man. Being from California, not everyone says hi to you. <laughs> so it's nice It's nice to be treated like a regular person. <laughs> it's a good place to be human. <laughs> Yuma, Arizona. So here we go, downtown Yuma, Main Street. This is where uh, all the action happens. Charming downtown. There were some ladies that didn't want to be on camera, but they said when the surge was happening here a couple months ago, you wouldn't feel it at all down here. Like, you you wouldn't know. They wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. Which is the opposite of what, uh, when you're in, like, South Texas. I mean, those folks see it instantly. Right. So if you're not paying attention to good reporting like yours, Thank you, sir. Uh, you're like, no issue. So to get a totally different perspective, we'd go to the NGOs, talk with some of the people there who are going to be more doesn't matter where you're from 
or what the rules mm -hmm. are, everyone should be let in types. Yes. I don't want to over oversimplify. And lots of the NGOs, the responsibility is to coordinate the travel okay. uh, for the migrants. So That's their job. Yeah. I was just in Denver. They have about 3,000 migrants that have been dropped off since December. Yeah. Those are coming from Catholic uh, churches and NGOs in El Paso. So they're not necessarily being bused by Governor Greg Abbott. They're being bused by the, by the Catholic churches to relieve those communities. Why are the Catholic charities involved in this? Do you know that story? Basically, when Border Patrol is completely overwhelmed, yeah. they look at NGOs and churches to get some relief and they'll leave it up to them to coordinate the travel. When those NGOs coordinate the travel, uh, in some cases, the federal government will reimburse that NGO or that Catholic church. And I've heard different numbers on that, so I can't speak credibly about it, but there's money in that. Yes, um, there's, there's, still, there's gonna be investigations, I think, leading up. I know Texas Governor Greg Abbott wants okay. some attention paid to the NGOs in, in South Texas, but um, they are reimbursed. Um, and, you know, they're, I mean, they're coordinating thousands of, of traveling migrants, whether it's through airplane, through uh, busing programs. Like I said, just, just in Denver alone, since early December, 3,000 migrants have been uh, brought up. They're all coming from El Paso, 90% right. Um, right now Venezuela. How do they feel about it in Denver, or is it hard to tell? Uh, in Denver, they are on the brink of an emergency because they already have a homeless issue. So you now have Venezuelan migrants using up the homeless resources there in Denver. And when I was, um, you know, there reporting, um, these Venezuelan migrants don't know where to go. They don't know where to work. So the only jobs they're able to work is uh, plowing snow for businesses right now. Okay, but there is that a sanctuary city? Does that yes. have any, anything to do with it? Like it's better to go to a sanctuary city? Yeah, so it's, okay. a, it's a sanctuary city. Uh, the mayor is a Democrat, the governor uh, is a Democrat. And just recently, uh, New York uh, Mayor Adams and the mayor of Chicago Lightfoot actually penned a letter to the Colorado governor and said, please stop busing migrants to our cities because our cities have been overwhelmed by the governor's buses of Texas. So you, have you spent time south? You spent a lot of time south of the border, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so you, what, what is like the feel down there? You speak fluent Spanish, you can listen to everybody. What's the, what's the take there? Like, how are they dealing with it? What's the story on that side? If you speak to the locals, they, they understand why the migrants want to come to the U.S. Yep. They just don't agree how it's being done, and they feel that their towns are being over, overrun and controlled by our narco traffickers. One of the towns that had a really unique feel was Pedras Negras, Mexico. Okay. And that's across from it is Eagle Pass, Texas. And right. when I was there, um, after reporting and, and talking to locals and speaking with sources, uh, the cartel there is actually the Mexican police. So you actually, when you're on the ground, you see Mexican police kind of facilitate some of the kind of smuggling or just like allow it to happen and, and, and turn their back. And that scares the locals because they feel like they can't almost, they can't live peacefully in their city knowing that basically you have your own police involved with narco trafficking and human smuggling. So it's not just a U.S. border problem, it's a Mexican border problem. Yes. And then the countries are also impacted um, on the way. So I've been speaking with locals in Panama, a lot of small yeah. business owners, um, who are telling us that now their towns are being overrun by narco traffickers moving in these massive wave of migrants. And that's kind of the other issue you don't see is, is how it impacts those countries, the city of Tapachula, which is the very first border town in Mexico after you cross from Guatemala. I mean, they've they've been, I mean, almost completely taken over by just having thousands of migrants come. And the reason why we saw the Haitian migration in September 2021 is because so many Haitians were bottled up in Tapachula. Mexican officials basically gave them legal permits to travel through Mexico to, to cross illegally in the U.S. Okay. A lot of those Haitians came from Chile and other countries, right? Yeah, a lot of those the Haitians have been living in Chile for at least five years. They speak fluent Spanish and have middle-class uh, jobs back in Chile. I'm very much surprised how cheap produce and products are here. Oh man, coming from Cali, dude, everything is cheap to Yeah. Me. Coming from Cali, the first thing you do is stare at the gas station and look at the prices and be like, <laughs> oh my god. Look at two pair of jeans for 15 bucks. Dude. Avocado, 69 cents. At least a bug 25 in Cali. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Maybe I just uh, buy all my avocados and smuggle them back to the Golden State. <laughs> Have you been back to El Salvador? No, man. You've never been there? But I'm, I'm planning to go this year. Uh, so your parents didn't want you to get back there? Well, my, my dad just returned last year because a new President Bukele has, uh, according to him, has like turned everything around. Okay. So Bukele okay. has been like really aggressive against 
uh, MS-13, and my dad said he came back and like the economy's doing great. He feels safer than ever, and for the first time, like El Salvador's finally like booming huh. and back, which is like complete opposite of like what our neighbors like Guatemala and Nicaragua. I mean, Nicaragua's going through the absolute worst right now, uh, but Ni but El Salvador's on the up and up, which is uh, which is pretty interesting. I mean, for us, it's it's, it's great because we never had the country at a good point. You know, the last time my dad got to see his country, it was a civil war and him being like forced to fight in it for the government. And then wow. now he could come back as an adult, um, you know, established in the U.S. and like actually enjoy it and, and everything. So it's it's kind of a cool story, man, honestly, of what's, what's happening over there. What's he feel about this situation right now at the border? You know, he, he understands it. He, 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 you know, he, he feels the people, but for him it's, you know, he feels like the people are watering down what it means to be like a U.S. citizen. Um, by just coming in the way they are illegally, uh, you know. So for for him, it's just like he gets it, but he, he you know he wants kind of like these migrants to just do it legally and not overwhelm like the resources and everything like that. It's kind of calmed down a little bit, right? I guess. But if you're not telling us what's going on, yeah, we don't know. yeah, that's so true. Yeah, you right. See. So you're, 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 yeah, man, this is the guy. How huh? trip out? How many people follow you around here? Oh yeah, yeah. If, I was actually speaking to a local reporter. She's like, "You have a lot of fans in you." I was like, you "Really?" Have a lot, yeah. And I'm like, "That's we good." We don't know though. what's going on but, really unless you <laughs> tell us what's going on. When the feds were secretly flying out migrants, oh he, yeah, we he, 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 he got a bunch of pictures leaked. It originally started happening when the, all the uh, people were crossing the border. You, we didn't see it. We we only heard about it. It was just rumblings. We just saw pieces of it when. Planes would leave at five in the morning or four in the morning and somebody snapping some pictures of them because there's a immigration a, a customs bus bringing them into the, to the uh, airport. It's like, so what's going on? That's the, I was our first glimpse of it. That's like, what, what is this all about? Right. So you would see all these people get off and it's barely light, right? So they're doing it four in the morning, depending on the season and when the sun rises. And then people would just get off of this bus and then go around and get on a plane. And so we didn't feel it then until it got too much and then too much for them to handle and the overspill and the NGOs weren't able to handle and do all the things because they were running out of resources and the people were just left on the streets and then you would start to interact with people because it wasn't that smooth of a process. So Johnny, give us, yeah. give us a rundown. Jorge was saying you're the guy okay that knows the situation you're saying he's the guy that knows the situation jorge is but, the guy yeah but so, you live here well we live here and uh we used to have a good relationship with the border patrol like we were with the public information officer for quite a bit of time and we would get daily updates would find out what's going on but since biden is in office we no longer have that privilege and it's tight-lipped how do people feel about the situation in yuma because if you walk around downtown yuma you wouldn't know anything's going on is there, are people involved with it? Are they ignoring it? Like, what's the vibe here? So, the, we, we get involved with it because yeah. you see them. They'll come up to you, they'll ask you for stuff. So you get involved by talking to them or sure. where can I get my phone? I'm promised, a, they know they're gonna get a phone somewhere. So a lot of times they're asking, where can I get my phone? Or They get a phone? Yeah, they get a phone. When free they, phone? They get a free phone. Okay. Yeah, okay. they get a free phone. They come over here and they try to find out certain things. And I got a story if you want it. Hit me, hit me. Uh, Christmas morning, Christmas lands on a Sunday. I'm at service. I go to a service at a little tiny home church in Winter Haven, California. 6 a.m. We did it morning, like a sunrise service. Sure. Four people from Honduras knock on the door okay. at 6 a.m. And they just got done walking 11 hours. And it was three men and one woman. And the girl could barely walk. She could just, she was just doing this, like so right. slow and so worn out. And she, they just said, we, can we just get some water? Can we, you know? Uh -huh. They knew Spanish and the, one of the uh, parishioners knew Spanish. And so we took him in, we let him sleep for a little while, let him rest. They rested in the back, got him some new clothes that were wet. All their clothes were wet. They must have came through the river. Um, so Winter Haven, that's where the border is, is in Winter Haven, okay. California, okay. Al the Algodonas border. So we kind of see that quite a bit. But this is the first time real interaction. And we're to church, so we did the church thing and we sure. took care of them. And we, uh, we got them some clean clothes and stuff like that. Sure. And they slept for like three hours in the little back room. They were just out like that as soon as they so went down. So your humanity came through, you wanted to help them? Yeah. 
That's what it was, right? Because you're seeing it that close. And even when I brought it up on the radio show the next day, I got a lot of flack. You okay. should have called the border patrol. You should have did this. You yeah. should have. Why, why didn't you call? Turn him in. But turn him into who? What? what, what nobody's doing anything right now. It's just the it, border the patrol won't do anything. No, they, they they catch them and they release them. You know, yeah, until yeah. their court date. These people were actually on the way to San Francisco, and they had a route already set up. They knew what trains to jump. They were going to jump a train. Oh. They were going to go down to the train where they know the trains meet. Yeah. And they were going to jump a train. And they were going to get all the way from there to Los Angeles, from Los Angeles to San Francisco, where one of them is promised a job as a mechanic. In one sentence, I'll give you two if you need it. Okay. Well, how would you sum up this current situation on the border? It's definitely a crisis, but it's like a silent crisis that you're not really supposed to talk about. Um, you're not supposed to, t okay, we're gonna go way more than two sentences because okay. this is interesting. You're not supposed to talk about says who. Well, it's like a little, it's a secret. It's a, 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 there was a time where there was a whole hotel that was taped off. It was constant, it was all taped off and they had security at the front and you couldn't ask what was going on there. I asked, I'm nosy. So I showed up, what's going on here? And they say, uh, we can't tell you. In Yuma? In Yuma, yeah, there was hotels. There was a few of them. There was a couple of them, actually. And the whole place was set up for the migrants to come in or legal aliens, whatever you want to call them, asylum seekers. And they, they were put up in a hotel. When it was brought to the mayor, well, it's good for the economy because the hotel sold out. So which is it, right? Is it good for the economy or what are we doing here? But then it's a, through a lot of NGOs, non-government uh, organizations that have raised the money to put it up. And so you see it, we know it's not supposed to be happening, but you just like, you just go with it. What you just, what you just said connected with me, what are we doing here? I've talked to border patrol agents off air and they have the same question. What are we doing off the record? They feel like human smugglers. I grew up in Yuma, Arizona. We're right at the border. A lot of my friends became Border Patrol agents. They honorable. They wanted to do a good job. For a long time, they were proud of what they were doing. Now, that morale is gone. And they all have to be quiet about it. Even talking to me about it, even off air or off record, is still like, it's a, it's, it, they just kind of put their heads down. They'll lose their jobs? If they yeah, like yeah, if they talk about it too much on social media, like you can't talk about it. But and so they're just careful about it, and they're just upset about what they're doing because it used to be a process. They used to know what they were doing. Now they don't know what's going on, and nobody's really allowed to ask those questions. Here's the biggest thing that upset me is when our senators came. They came to the border. It was going to be a big deal. Our local news station went out and covered the border, and it was cleaned up. It was totally cleaned up. There was no nobody in line or nobody getting processed. No, tra no, the sheriff told me no. There was a ton of trash. They cleaned up the trash. They cleaned up the trash. Yeah, cleaned up everything. And it was six in the morning when uh, the news. Right when I was getting ready to go on air, our local news station tweeted that out. I said, "What the heck?" And he did a side by side picture of what it looked the week previous until the day the senators come. So they came and they saw nothing. They. They saw nothing. They saw a cleaned up border. Who's doing that? Who told them to clean up? How'd the cartels know? Don't run it. Today's not the day. Those are the questions we have, but. All right, we'll keep at it, Johnny. Yeah, Thank I will, you. man. Thank you. Uh, your radio station, can people listen all over the country or what's it? What's yeah, so that? Russ Clark, the Russ Clark Show, you can find that on, uh, on uh, Facebook. And then you could just tune in. We broadcast every day on Twitter, Facebook. Let's go. <laughs> you wanna do it? Do it, yeah, get him in. So, Mike. Yes, sir. All right, you live here in Yuma. I'm just going to quote yeah, this right here. Yeah, we've been here about 27 years. 27 years. We came from L.A., actually East L.A. Okay, so tell us the story in, in brief What's with the border right now. What are your thoughts? Well, the border, nothing has nothing's been done about it. Ever since Biden took over, it's just no one wants to touch the subject. Do you guys feel like you've been left out, like no one's paying attention to you? Yeah, exactly, because they pay more attention to Texas okay. than we do here in the small town of, of Yuma, Arizona. We're like you know, push to the side. That's exactly how the, the way I see it. 
that's how you guys feel. Mm -hmm. Look at the government, uh, governor of Texas, what he did. He got a bunch of people, sent them, sent them to New York. Well, those other, 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 you know, uh, sure. you know, California, what, whatever. But here in Arizona, this part, especially this part of here, they don't, they don't. I don't think they, they, they care for us, honestly. Until this time for re-election again, that's when they're gonna talk about it. That's when they're gonna bring it up. Oh, we're gonna do this and we're gonna do that. But it'll never happen. Mm. You know, it'll frustrating. Never yeah, it is frustrating. Peter, nice to meet Thanks, you. Thanks, Mike. Now, now you're in a video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right, Jorge, thank you, man, for bringing us in, giving us a lot of the little details that I find are always missing when I hear a border story. And I'm sure we missed some of them today. Like, it's a complex story. Yep. There's a lot to it. We're not talking to legitimate asylum seekers that had just suffered and dealt with the most horrific BS on the planet, right? Like, those people exist, but also the people that are economic migrants exist right right and usually when you're watching a story on the border someone picks a side and they just show one side right and i just want to make sure you guys know uh watch all sorts of content on this situation but also know a lot is being left out right now uh and it shouldn't be because no matter where you stand politically it really shouldn't be a political issue it should be like humanitarian crisis mm -hmm. this is unsustainable we need to figure out some sort of solution down the road. Yeah, and Peter, you know, we're glad that you came down uh, to, sh to shine a light on this issue. It's a really important one. It's a complex one. It's one yeah. where if people don't live next to the border, they might not understand sure. um, kind of the impact. So I feel like this is, a, is an important story. And hopefully this just creates conversation between people of, yep. and hopefully finding solutions down the road. Guys, Jorge's work, I'm going to leave his links down below. Check him out. He does the on the border content, the stuff that I can't really get into, speaks fluent Spanish, big help on the Mexican side a lot of the times. So really, really interesting content. Thanks again, bro. Appreciate yeah. it. Thanks, and uh, until the next one. Oh, sheriff videos. Watch those on the border. I just shot one yesterday. It should be posted around here. Quite unbelievable. All right, until the next one. <laughs>